Well, I want to introduce Hugo Chan to you. I met Hugo uh, on a Skype call about uh, 15 months ago and was really impacted by his, his love for the Lord and for his passion for what he does as a lawyer and the influence in the community. And I had the privilege of visiting him a few months ago in Hong Kong. And to say that Hugo makes Hong Kong work is not an understatement. He seemed to be connected everywhere. Things he'd set up, businesses he'd organized, things he'd left his imprint on for the kingdom throughout uh, Hong Kong. And in the last two or three years, he's had amazing opportunities to go into China and has been given great favor there. And so when I knew he was coming to London with his dear wife, you need to meet his parents-in-law to spend a few days, I said, could you carve out just a couple of hours? I have some special friends in London. I'd love them to hear what you've got to say. And he's graciously done <coughs> that. So, Hugo, it's all yours. Let us pray for you, and we look forward to what God will say with you. Father, we thank you that we can come together now at this lunchtime, and we pray that you would come by your spirit into this room. I pray that you would still our hearts so that we may not hear a human being, but we may hear you speaking through Hugo. Father, I pray that you would set our hearts on fire for you, for what you're doing as you build your kingdom, and give us enthusiasm for the part we can play in that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Paul, for, for allowing me and my wife to be here. Uh, before I speak, I must introduce my very beautiful wife, Yunyi. <coughs> I came to England first in 1973. I was studying in uh, somewhere in Hamill Hampstead, living in Watford, and I went to University of Southampton, and um, I did my law degree there, and um, I began to meet my, uh, see my, uh, this beautiful lady appearing at university. I said, I, I love you, I like you. She said, I don't like you. I said, I like you very much. She said, I, I don't like you at all. And that, uh, that's how started our relationship. And, and on the week of, our, uh, of my graduation in 78, uh, I was asking myself to go to a meeting that her church was organizing. And um, I went into the meeting, and the Holy Spirit touched me so much, I was crying for two hours and was just totally transformed. And ever since, I've been walking with the Lord and uh, went back to Hong Kong to... Um, to do um, my law practice in 79. So I'm very grateful to be back in, in, in England to um, hopefully one day to repay the debt of the gospel because the Lord is so good to us. And um, I want to use a little PowerPoint to present to you uh, some testimonies and what I have been experiencing in the last 30 over years in what I call Greater China. Because what, where we live, it's not just China, it's Taiwan and Hong Kong, it's Macau. And, uh, and Singapore is very, very much like a, like a tugboat. Um, this China is like an air carrier which is being launched now into open seas. And uh, for people who love the Lord and for, to want to see impact in the kingdom, uh, the season now is for for the Chinese people, so we have to we have to learn to equip them together. Uh, like uh, this past few days, we were just in Paris for a few days, and it was amazing to know there are half a million Chinese living in France, mm, and just uh, uh, yeah, in in in, in Paris is three hundred thousand, but half a million or more are now living in France, and and many of them are from one city. <laughs> just one city called Wanzhou. So it's quite amazing. Now, I want to um, introduce to you uh, um, uh, some of the things that what we call discipling gatekeepers in the marketplace. Uh, because anyone who is called to the Lord and yet being able to influence others to a greater extent, to me, is a gatekeeper. We allow what is to come in and what what is to go out. It's like the elders who sat uh, on the gates of Jerusalem or in any city. So in, in many ways that um, you and I, we are business leaders and professionals and entrepreneurs, we need to know what God is doing in this time and age. I was in, uh, in Paris really encouraging and admonishing these brothers. They are doing so well. They are making so much money. 
but they are only drinking their coffee in Champs Elysees. I say, no, you are here not because of your business. You're not here because of the lack of business in China. And then after 30 years, you're prospering. You are here because God sent you here and there is a destiny. So whether I'm a lawyer or whether you are a businessman or investment banker, um, I, I believe the Lord is now bringing an awareness to all of us that we are ministers, uh, not, just, uh, not just a professional, not just a businessman, not just an entrepreneur, but we have such a, a role and destiny that we can make an impact to the world um, together with uh, the religious leaders, because not just the pastors are Christian leaders, Bankers are also, lawyers are also. So I want to ex uh, share with you in this brief moment how the Lord had been using me and my wife and, and our family. Um, for the last 30 over years since I came back to Hong Kong in 79, I was just born again and full of the, the love of God. So I was telling stories, whether it's in my law office or whether at home, we pack, pack all the rooms that we're in, whether it's my law office or at home. We have been running house meetings, just like uh, the, those house meetings in China, and also the house meetings from house to house, what we read in the New Testament. So we began to practice what I saw Apostle Paul was doing. Apostle Paul was a lawyer, and he was also in business. And uh, if he can do it, I can do it. So, so for over 30 years, we would keep telling our testimonies, visiting people, healing the say, casting out demons, and just enjoying our lives. And uh, by doing that, people get saved. So, and, and by about that time, about 1982, on the 6th of June, I came in touch with this um, marketplace ministry called Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship. These uh, fairly loud Americans came to uh, Hong Kong and began to tell, as ordinary people, you can tell testimonies, get people saved, and, and Holy Spirit and all that. So I was just beginning to, um, to, um, to work as a lawyer, but I, I caught the vision, and I have been involved with it ever since. So I'm national director a full gospel businessman fellowship in Hong Kong. We're very, we are very loud. We're not quiet. We have several hundred people of over a hundred churches, but we would we would sing and dance and tell stories in all the restaurants and hotels in Hong Kong, and get a lot of people saved. When we share our testimony, three four people with 10, 15 minutes testimony, all the guests are touched. I just say, you come out now if you want to enjoy a life of freedom and and and. Uh, and um, a blessing like this, and come and ask the Lord into uh, your life. So we regularly do that, and we've been doing that in China too. But my heart is not satisfied when, after 30 over years, w the church that we helped founded, it's called the Praise Assembly. It is a marketplace church because ordinary people doing it. From one house meeting, we grew to about four or 5,000 people in eight districts in Hong Kong alone. So we have about 15 to 16 congregations, all led by lawyers, professionals, and, and I'm no, no longer an elder in the church. I want to go back to the marketplace because after so many years, I became s so religious. When I give out my lawyer card, they argue with me, no, you are a pastor. I think, no, lawyer, no money, no go. You know, the, <laughs> the, the, the word law actually is water and go. If you don't pay, I won't go. I said, I am a lawyer put your money as cost an account, then I would act. And they, they argue with me, they know, I see you in television, I see you every big meeting, you are a pastor. I say, no. But after, after a while, I realized I became very religious. To, to them, I am a religious leader, and they don't want to associate with me as a lawyer. So I repented. Now I spend 80% of my time doing my law practice, and I spent into other other uh, businesses. Uh, really, uh, that's a calling. Uh, I've never felt that I want to just preach on Sunday and just do uh, Christian uh, training uh, within the church system. And uh, one of my elders now is the uh, 
the one that I helped ordain is the chief judge of the Supreme Court of Hong Kong. If he can lead a church of over a thousand people, a lot of people can. Because we, he would say, here I am, Lord, please send them. <laughs> uh, he is not the busiest uh, person uh, uh, in his congregation. So businessman fellowship or, or church is all in the marketplace. And, and after so many years, I, I began to understand, I'm, and um, we were contemplating, what is the great commission that, that, the, that the Lord Jesus has given us? Because he said, go and make disciples of the nations, not just make uh, converts or make disciples of individuals, but he wants uh, uh, nations to be impacted. And when we understand that, then we can't just live a religious life. Because one can be very Christian and one can be very busy with uh, activity, and yet n nobody engaged with you uh, on the other uh, social arenas or cultural arenas that impact society most. If you are in business, in finance, in banking, in law, we impact people most. But the rest of the world, if they think you're Christian, they, they do not engage with you on that level, and we don't make an impact. So w recently, this is what we've been thinking. How can we impact the nations? And someone is saying that the Great Commission that Jesus given us is not just to make uh, converts and turn people into Christians so that they can sing on Sunday. No. Uh, Jesus said, I will build my church, but he said, you, my disciples make disciples of the other nations. So when I realize that, then my life is, is very, very different because then I have to, to be very aware that my family is my testimony and, and my uh, business is my ministry because that's how nations will be impacted uh, unless we have strong families. We have no, no stories to tell. This is why I like Businessman Fellowship. We tell testimonies. I tell our brothers, all our members, unless you have a story to tell about your wife, your children, your father, and your brothers and sisters at home, we don't have meetings. And unless you have money to buy air tickets, we don't have outreach. So, so it's, it's quite practical. And someone recently, I don't know, I read this book. I um, can't remember his name. Uh, Dallas Willett, yeah. He said the Great Commission is making disciples for the nations. And the Great Omission is to make Christians for church membership. And that's a, a hard word to, to swallow, but, but what I've learned from him is so true. He is basically saying the Bible is written by disciples for disciples, to make disciples for the nations. It's not for people who are comfortably sitting in a Christian environment and thinking that uh, I'm, already, I'm already doing my bit. What more do I expect? So these days, my challenge uh, is to, to everybody and say, hey, you're not just a believer. And no, you're not even just a disciple. I think God has called you and singled you out as an apostle in the marketplace. Some of these people, they... They, they think, I'm already chairman of the finance committee and I'm already ushering on Sunday. What more do you want me to do? I tithe and I, I pray to the Lord. I'm only a top banker. I say, no, <laughs> you are an apostle in the marketplace. Disciple other people whom the pastors cannot touch. This is why we have the movement of the gatekeepers. And when we read the Bible, the uh, uh, Isaiah 2nd chapter, Isaiah Verse 2, it says, in the end times, in the end days today, the temple of the presence, of, the temple of the mountain of the Lord shall prevail and be raised up higher than all the other mountains. And Holy Spirit is saying to um, the churches today, yes, there are seven or more major mountains or seven or more gates or or arenas, social, cultural arenas where greatest impact are made to, um, to the world. 
and can change the world. And the Lord is saying that we need to recognize and raise people so that we are top and not bottom. Because when I look around, oftentimes Christians are walking around at the bottom of the hill and thinking that, what more do you want me to do? Some even pray prayers, say, Lord, don't make me too busy. Don't give me too much business. Or don't promote me in this, uh, in this business or sector. Otherwise, I can't teach Sunday school. Or I can't go to my um, uh, fellowship meeting. I believe this is a very wrong concept because the enemy had, had some deceptive uh, schemes against us. One, he would do everything to hinder us from moving upward so that we would stay at the bottom. The moment you go up or go, in the, go up, he would somehow cause you to fall down. So he would stop us from moving up. It's not being proud of what we are, but to be in a position so that we can make decisions and, and influence others. The enemy hates that. Number two, he would do everything to make us fall. If you are successful, you either fall because of immorality or pride or loneliness. This is why we have businessmen fellowship. If you're in a businessman fellowship regularly, you can't hide very long. Because in church, you can hide. Church, you only preach, but you don't tell testimonies. You don't tell people how you are. Because in a close-knit businessman fellowship, we would ask you, why are you not happy? I would say, next week, can you tell your testimony? Then you say, these few weeks, you know, going through a hard time. So we would immediately know that you have family problem, finance problem, and, and spiritual problem. So we won't be so lonely. And, and, and uh, the enemy would want us to fall down because of loneliness, immorality, or just simply being offended. But in close fellowship, maybe something like this is very, very precious. And the Lord can protect us. And then, and then we can encourage one another because there are people who think that I need to really uh, offer my life as a sacrifice to the Lord and, and maybe I leave my partnership and uh, maybe I would no longer be the chairman of this company and I'm going to study in a Bible school and go into ministry. There are still people who think like that. To me, it's, it really is it's, uh, it's not necessary. Um, I can't say I, 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 I have stronger views than that, but you know, I respect and other people. Maybe 2 or 3% of the people really need to really s devote themselves, to really equip themselves and study to become a scholar. But most of us just love the Lord, read the Word, and saturate yourself with the presence of God and just... Um, be the mobile ark of God wherever you are and impact the world. So discipleship to me is really knowing God is Father and He has an inheritance for, for, um, for me. And today I'm more and more moving into this. I say, Lord, I want to dig the wells of Abraham. How come some of these streams of living water are not gushing out? Because the enemy has filled these wells of our fathers with mud and there's mud in my head that I'm not being innovative and I'm not being uh, uh, excellent and I'm not being um, excelling. I'm not, I'm not allowing the waters to gush out from the wells of Abraham, which is my inheritance. So I think as Jesus came to this world to reveal the Father, we, he said, as the Father sent me, I sent you. So every marketplace disciple is sent by God to reveal the Father. That Father wants us to ask him, Lord, I ask of you, please grant me the nations as my inheritance. This is why I'm so excited. This is why my wife and I are excited because we have three daughters. And somehow as we were talking like this, hey, one became a missionary to um, the Arab world. One went to Africa and the other one went to Southeast Asia, it, it brings so much pleasure to us by seeing that our next generation can hear God too. <coughs> so if we are called in, in the business world, you have a call to business. If we are in the business world, we have an apostolic mandate because business leaders change culture. 
if you don't change their culture, their culture will change your culture. And if we say we have a kingdom culture and we are the, the, not the mainstream culture, we are not doing it right and we have to put it right. So there is an apostolic mandate for us to transform the cultures of the marketplace. And um, we, we, need to, uh, we need to realize that we are ambassadors of the kingdom of God into this, this uh, a world. So as Jesus is covering us, he's granting us kingdom uh, keys. We have keys of the kingdom. We have the key of David. We can un unlock situation. I was sharing with Paul how I learned to unlock certain keys in China. I used to go into China maybe for almost 20 years, but only in the last few years as I really understand more of my calling, my role, and I become less religious, more focused on the call uh, to business, then I began to hold certain keys and I go into a situation and instead of trying to hit open using my head, I, I open the door. Uh, you know, I've been to China, even Beijing, over a hundred times, and I'm not seeing the, the results because there's something we need to get a hold of by realizing that we are called to prevail over the seven gates. There are certain positions that God has either put us there or want us to go up there. The enemy wants to pull us down, want us to relocate, um, but we are gatekeepers and we have to prevail over these, these gates. And business gate is a very important gate. And it is the mandate of Jesus that every believer is called to prevail over the gates and go to the marketplace and disciples the people. Um, I have more example of that in the nations in a minute, to disciple the nations. Um, in the last four, five years, in Hong Kong four years ago, I started publishing a magazine called Happy, Happy Man magazine, just being happy, interviewing people who are happy because happiness and success are related. Uh, successful people mostly not very happy, but happy people mostly are successful. So I want to find out what is their pursuit of happiness. Some are Christian, some are non-Christian, but using it to interview top business people, government people, and it broadened my access into them. As gatekeepers, this is how we like to put it, we are a body of believers empowered by the Holy Spirit to transform the culture of nations through discipling men and women to do the work of the kingdom. We have to bring in an awareness that we are not just believers, but we are disciples, and disciples uh, look like his father, like father, like son, and the father has the whole world as his family and the nations to his heart. But the challenge to Christian people is we all congregate in the church gate. We all congregate in the church mountain. It's so overcrowded that sometimes I couldn't stand it. I just can't stand being with Christians. I say, get out of this place. We, we, uh, because church is, it's, a army barrack is not the battlefield. The battle is out there at home and in your office with your clients and with your friends. Don't fight in the uh, army barracks because if you don't have enough to do, you fight each other and you step on the backs of the people <laughs> in front of you. It's terrible. So I say, and I ask the Lord, how can we export the process of discipleship that we've been doing and learning to do in the last 2,000 years, exported into the other arena. I don't have a quick answer, but I'm very interested to see how, and, and very interested to talk to pastors. In fact, I'm preaching to the converts. I love to preach to the pastors, to ask them and challenge them, do you have a plan? How do you equip people to be uh, uh, senior reporters and editors? Like in Taiwan, we, we have a march of 300,000 people in the city of Taipei on family, core values. Basically, it's, it's, it's an issue with the LGBT movement. But then, um, and uh, the leaders are so saddened, none of the newspaper reported on them. 
Of course, you have not been training people to be chief editors of the mainline newspapers. We should not be training people to become pastors so much. We should train them to become anchors and news uh, reader and uh, and uh, newspaper editors. Uh, the owners of the televisions in Taiwan were frustrated because they themselves are Christians. But how come our key guys are not telling the story? And and uh, and then we realize, and then we realize it's not just the owners; it's the key people that we must. Uh, uh, plant them there. So I realized, like Nehemiah, the Nehemiahs need to work with the Ezra's. Ezra's are the clergy, the Christian pastors, leaders, um, church leaders, but the marketplace leaders are the Nehemiahs. The Nehemiahs are the people who can get the goldsmiths, the bankers, and um, the government uh, leaders together. And within 52 days, the walls of Jerusalem were restored through family restoration, through neighborhood uh, meetings like this, uh, within several tube stations. You come here, and it's, in Hong Kong, we have 26 lunchtime meetings for marketplace people. Every uh, underground station, we have one above. Because we say you need Monday to Saturday to go to one of these or more in order to, for you to fellowship with other people to pray, to worship, to encourage one another in, 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 in testimonies and to be prayed for. So really linking up the gatekeepers on the seven gates is what we need to do. It, in Hong Kong, for so many years, we were evangelizing. And with Full Gospel Businessman Fellowship, we say we, we operate in gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we are a little bit empowerment. That, but as iOS 1, we're moving up to iOS 2, and we need to move up to iOS 3 to, uh, to equipping uh, people as say, we must challenge them. You're not just a believer. You are a disciple, and you're not just a disciple. You actually call very clearly selected, prepared by the Lord as an apostle. <coughs> Some of us have that calling so that we can enlarge uh, the kingdom influence and extend the kingdom. Very good example is uh, a pastor called uh, Chris, Chris Volaton from the Bethel Church. Uh, he was telling us this story recently in Hong Kong. He said uh, in California, Reading, we have maybe 100,000 in our city, and we have six, 7,000 people in our congregation, and over one or two, maybe one or 2,000 students from all over the world. So they must have 8,000, 9,000 people, and it's a strong, uh, Holy Spirit Church and then three years ago he was reading the newspaper and on the uh, on the newspaper it says the uh, social economic index of the cities and their city <laughs> is at the bottom how come they think we are very influential should be making an impact to the city how come economically socially we're at the bottom so these these brothers they say we repent we, we got uh, together and we pray, and the first thing we did, they did something very crazy. They give one-tenth, uh, one 10% 10 of all their income to the government. So that when, they, when they approached the government, they, they, they were very uh, uh, not sure, I mean, what agenda it <laughs> is, are you trying to, uh, uh, oh, what, what, what is it? But after so, so long, they know that there is no strings attached, they just want to bless. So they began to tell them, hey, we have this breach that is out of repair and some sort of problem. So Chris said, no problem, we have experts and we, we can help. So they fixed the breach. And after fixing the breach, they say, our park also uh, is, needs some help. So they fixed the park. And then they say, um, we have this city hall. Actually, for 40 years, it's running at a loss. And we see 2,000 people there. And they sent their convention center people there. Obviously, they fixed it, it ticked over, and they make half a million money, uh, uh, um, half a million dollars of profit out of it. And then they said, um, we have, don't have enough people to sweep the streets. So they send the students to sweep the streets as, as prayer walk or whatever. So, so much so, the chairman of the economic board of the city came to them and say, 
Mr. Chairman of your economic board, can I join you, your church economic board? Because last year, I only created one new job. You guys created 100 new jobs. So that's making an impact. And Oz Hillman, uh, we read somewhere, that he said, if we're going to have a positive influence in culture, we must rethink our strategy from getting more people saved to getting more kingdom marketplace leaders in the places of influence. And I say amen to that. And we all have been reading the lives of um, Wilberforce. And uh, like the Wilberforce, Oz Hillman was saying, culture is defined by a small number of change agents who operate at the top of the cultural spheres of societal mountains. It takes less than three to five percent of those operating at the top of a cultural mountain to actually shape the values presented, represented on that mountain. And, and recently, actually, I was in, uh, in Vancouver with Mark Burnett. Mark Burnett is the one who produced The Survivor, the, um, all the top rating uh, TV shows in America. Um, uh, like with Trump, that one, you're fired, that one. Uh, um, so, yeah, the, the, the Apprentice. So he put his own money into producing the Bible series. And, uh, of course, it became the, the number one rating uh, television show. And uh, so we need top people like that to be motivated in the kingdom of God. And when we met with Mark, he said, I'm a very loud Christian. Uh, you can say whatever he was, he's number one, you know, in six top rating television shows. So when people ask him, is the Bible true? I mean, I mean, you really believe in the Bible? Of course, he said, of course, it's 100% true. And Jesus Christ is the son of God. So he produced a film like that. He can say whatever he can say because he is so successful. And Dr. Peter Wagner said, um, he was lamenting that we have attempted, attempted to transform our cities for years without success. And he says, now I believe the reason is because pastors and church leaders do not have the authority to do so. And that authority lies within those leaders in the marketplace. Whenever we recognize and affirm the apostles in the marketplace, we will begin to see transformation in the city. Amen. Recently, in the last two years, in Singapore, together with Hong Kong, we, we are beginning to be aware that there are gatekeepers in our midst who are not being motivated. Uh, this is uh, Brother Kuan Tiam. He, he helped me launch me 32 years ago into this marketplace ministry. So in, in, in Singapore, he has some friends that he recently motivated. Mr. Lim, Lim Xiang Guan, he is the chairman of uh, the Sovereign Fund, the, you know, the, the uh, Investment Corp of Singapore, Government Investment Corporation. And of course, he used to probably think that I'm already uh, a leader in the church, and what more do you want me to do? And we were encouraging one another, no, you are an apostle in the marketplace, because whatever you said, you said, uh, they say, the, the government listened to you, and the finance will listen to you. So he now put together people uh, of his own kind of uh, stature and gather them as round tables, as circles, periodically, and to disciple one another um, um, for that purposes. And, and that's uh, a top bishop in, um, in uh, Anglican bishop in Singapore. He also said, I'm not just a bishop, I'm an apostle to the church leaders. I need to really get them together to come and work with you guys in the marketplace. So, and uh, there are th three levels of discipling. We need to recognize and affirm some of those who are really in the top strategic level. And then all the other men and women, uh, we also need to encourage. Disciples you train, but apostles you can only recognize because God has already made them. You don't train them. God has already trained them. But disciples need to be trained. And then they're young people. They are full of fire. They have no inhibition. We should let them loose and do whatever God has given them to do. 
So the, for the women, some brothers are motivating them. Yeah, she's a top banker in Singapore. And she said, oh, am I really? And so I um, have an apostolic mandate to ment mentor uh, others? Wow. Jason, Jason Wong, was for many years the second in command in the prison authority in Singapore. But God gave him a vision that we need to have a national fathers movement. Get the fathers together. The real fathers, not the spiritual father, but the real fathers. So he launched six years ago the Dads for Life. And it's a government project, community project. As to the extent that um, uh, corporations, government, and the community work together. Of course, there are Christians who work together, but this is a national community project to help fathers to spend time with their kids, you know, to fly kites, to go to the beach, and just do things that the kids enjoy. Uh, with corporation um, uh, support, maybe, you know, give an allowance, like maternity leave, that kind of thing. It's, uh, so it's a wonderful thing. And his revelation is something, because he was sharing Exodus 18. There are three, four verses there. In Exodus, uh, in Genesis 18, verse 18 and 19 is all about God telling Abraham, in order for you to be a blessing to the nations, to become a great nation and blessing to the nations, you must teach your children and your own household. Not telling them to be a Sunday school teacher or to be a pastor, but as a father teaching your own children. If every father would do that, then so that, so that what I promise you would be, would come true. But these two verses, Jason was sharing us, there are one and two verses in front and behind. In front of this promise and, and fantastic revelation, is God looking at Sodom, and the angels were saying to Abraham, while the angels were on the way to destroy Sodom, the Lord said, should I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And then he went into verse 18 and 19 about the family. It's almost like you know a, a very important revelation hidden between what God intends to do, but I would change my mind if you get this right. And then things would change. And then verse 20, it says, the outcry of, from against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great that I have to go down and do something about it. So this is, this is what, what Jason was sharing about some of these LGBT movements in Singapore that not to be saying things against anybody, but let's put our acts together as father and family. So the family gate is so important. Recently, we gathered in Hong Kong, seven gatekeepers from Taiwan, and seven of them from Singapore, and seven from Hong Kong. We look at all these seven mountains, seven, seven gates, and do some landscaping to see what is God doing in our nation in these areas. Because we learn from the uh, Taiwanese people. When they put uh, together this kind of landscaping um, uh, meeting, then they come up with ideas, and they actually made a report to the to Ma Yingjiu in Taiwan, their leader in Taiwan, the president, and say, we Christian people have this suggestion. In terms of family, this is what we think should be done. In terms of business, this is what we see is happening. In terms of media, we also recognize that there are certain things happening, and uh, perhaps you should also understand this is what's happening. And after reading that report, Taiwan president made one of the, I think, last two years, one year as the family year of Taiwan. So it's, it's, something is happening. And as a personal testimony to you, I want to share some testimonies now of my own family and, and what I've been doing in China. This is my beloved wife. And, and we have three uh, daughters. My family background is exactly that. That Samdongok village, Paul had been, it's a local history museum. Because my father and my fathers, my forefathers were all idol worshippers, Hakka people who came from central China, migrated to 
Hong Kong 100 years ago, and they lived in walled villages. So my religion, before I was a Christian, was temple worship. My father was a very, very famous leader in temple worship. But praise the Lord, uh, 14 years ago, one day, he just accepted our challenge. He's asked Jesus into his heart. Now he's 86. He's the oldest member of the full gospel businessman and the most fiery one. He had been to, he said he had been easily to 150 churches to share his testimony. And uh, very powerful testimony. He's, he's always calling me, Hugo, where are you? What are you doing? Shall we do this? I, I have to say, please give me a break. I had enough to do. <laughs> he said, let's do this. Let's launch that. Let's, uh, let's get the uh, indigenous people saved. And oh, he's, every day he's calling me. He's, a, he's an everlasting father to me. <laughs> every day he calls me two, three times. But now I, I move, actually moved back to live with him uh, next door to him. He's so precious. So my three daughters are called to the nations because we say, Lord, we ask you, please, Give me the nations. And, and Rebecca, by the grace of God, went to uh, the Middle East. She went to Egypt. She speaks Arabic and worked in Jordan and uh, met a young man in Jerusalem and now happily married. We have three grandchildren. And these three grandchildren, they've been on to mission trips ever since they were born. And very exciting family. My second daughter had a lot of problem with us, but by the grace of God, she turned. You know, for years, I could not even enter her room and talk to her. But God has a destiny in her life. I never gave her up. I said, Lord, you have a destiny for her. So I, I never, you know, just stood there. And she thanked me afterwards, you know. Thank you for just standing there when I'm so disgusting. <laughs> but then she went to uh, Africa for five years and to find out the, the, the un un unsaved people group. And Esther had been joining YWAM also in the last five years. Thank the Lord for my three daughters. But as family, we can do so much. I have a family friend by the name of Thomas Kwok. And uh, well, in terms of wealth, he probably is one of the wealthiest person, number 25 maybe, in the world. Because Sanong Kai is the largest developer in Hong Kong. They build and manage at least 15% of what you see in Hong Kong. And he became a Christian um, maybe, maybe 17, 18 years ago. And, um, and I was one of his lawyers. And I was working on the island of Mawan for one of his projects. He, they want to build 5,000 apartments on this little island next to the airport. And then 1997 came. This financial tsunami came. And 98, there was nothing much to do. So I was daydreaming, and I was looking at my daughter's uh, drawing Noah's Ark, and I we proposed to the to the Kwok family and to government. Since the government want you to build a theme park in Hong Kong, why don't you build Noah's Ark? And he said yes. So we worked on it, prayed, and motivated a lot of people, and spent millions of dollars. And then for six years, nothing happened. Nobody talked to me, and I continued to daydream. And then after 12 years, uh, uh, he began to build on it. And then two years ago, three years ago, it was now launched as a theme park. It's uh, a creation science and also for environment, for family, and for creation. It's, uh, it is a vision of an entrepreneur leader uh, making an impact on the world. Today, it's making an impact. So I want to quickly, uh, quickly uh, share. This is my father, very quickly. He is wanting to transform culture. So, so he's launching activities um, to change culture. And we need to exercise a breakthrough anointing so that with boldness and without restraint, because in the marketplace, there is actually no limit to what we can do. And as I said, I've come back to my law office. I have been in practice for over 30 years, but there were many, many years. I spent 80% of my time outside the office, but in so many years now I came back. This is the chief executive of Hong Kong. He's a personal friend, so so you can come to my office and we can do seminars together. And a few years ago, I asked the Lord, if I am a lawyer, I need to be known in China. I never thought like that. But then I thought, yeah, you can do that. So 
Yesterday I met a lawyer and I know their firm is the only firm that Xi Jinping, the president of China, ever visited. I thought that's the kind of firm I like to associate with. So I went to them and after a year or so, they, they said, we don't know why, we have 1,600 lawyers, we, we are not small, and you only have 30 people, but we don't understand why we've chosen you. We want you to be our associate firm. So I said, I asked uh, Mr. Yu, why? He said, you have a culture that is very different. You have a culture that we don't have. And it's the hallelujah kingdom culture. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked one day the Lord, what else can we do? So um, in fact, um, uh, now I'm involved with several things uh, under the, uh, the, the support of government of China. I became vice chairman of this China-Asia Tourism Cities Alliance, linking the Chinese cities with outside cities so we can visit other nations. This is the mayor of uh, Taichung. And, um, and then I'm also involved with media, a satellite company that recently launched and can be, uh, can be operated in China and doing some magazines too. One key breakthrough for me personally is for so many years I traveled to Israel attending prayer meeting and maybe speaking, but my heart is not satisfied. See, how can we touch the real Jewish nation? The government and the business people, and then uh, because we pray like that, one day the ambassador in Hong Kong came to my office and said, Mr. Chen, you don't know me, but we know you. Uh, you love our nation. It all started like that. So, so I formed a, a company linking the capital market of Hong Kong and helping the Israeli technology companies to go into China, but on a very high level, because through one man that I asked the Lord, China is so big, I have no technology background. I have Israeli technology companies all say they want to come to China. I have the ability to align the companies to the capital market in Hong Kong, but what do I do? China is so big, there's so many companies already, they are interacting with n not too many successes, what is the solution that I may be able to bring? And he said, call Mr. Lin. So I called up this Mr. Lin, whom I vaguely know, and the moment I called him, I said, Israel, China, uh, and Hong Kong, capital market, what say you? He said, did you pray to your God? Uh, I said, yes. <laughs> he said, how do you know that? I know this, you don't need to talk to anyone else. I was involved with this for 20 years. If you talk to me on this, no need to tell others. I will help you. So he brought me to central government, link up 21 universities, all the major bureaus and ministries, and we set up the International Center for the Development of Applied High Tech. It is, it's, it's God. And, and then with the same gentleman, because sometimes you need to hold only one key. It opens several doors. He said, ah, Pudong, Shanghai. We have now launched the free trade zone, which would impact the whole of China because that's the pilot scheme of liberalizing all the foreign exchange, all the investment, and all the corporate formalities. So with that, I am now in the process of bringing the Ferraris and the Maseratis to do a, a very large project in uh, in the Pudong airport area. We signed an agreement with the government. China is searching core values, rule of law, faith. Who can interpret the dreams of the pharaohs of China? So we, I like to say, we are the people. Because for so many years, I've been singing, dancing, and telling stories in China. This is what we've been doing all over China for 20 years. But today, I'm learning something New, uh, the kingdom culture of honoring is very important. We have to honor leaders, to honor our spiritual leaders, government leaders, and even our natural fathers. I began to stand up when my father appeared before me. That changed my heart, because if I honor my father at home, if I honor my spiritual fathers in the church, if I honor national leaders, somehow there's some anointing and, and blessing that is coming on my life that I feel I'm only learning. And in the past 20 years, we've been visiting the cities in China, linking up the Three Self Church and the government church and the, and the house church and the marketplace. And recently, 
we launch Pastor I Love You movement in China. And they catch it very quickly. For six years, every three months, we organize a meeting and invite all the pastors to come with their wives free of charge. We just say, marketplace leaders need your love and we love you. Please pray for us. Please let us uh, share with you what we feel is also important outside the church system. So with that, uh, we are you are connecting to one Zhao uh, system very much. So the breakthrough came in in um, a year end of last year. The government first time allowed a major two thousand people, businessmen, Christian businessmen, gathering with public altar call with all the government leaders there and top business people telling testimonies. So it's wonderful. I want to share briefly and then I finish the 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 uh, the, uh, the the one Zhao people that I. I went to visit. This is a phenomenon. You have to pray for these people. They are like the Jews of China because they have been living in China for so many years. And then 20 years ago, God sent 2 million of them all over China and all over the world. And two years ago, the train, the high speed train crashed right there at their center. So they are now awakening themselves to building a firmer foundation financially as well as spiritually in their nation. Uh, that might be the reason why they have invited us this last few weeks to go to Wanzhou community last in, week. in last week in Paris. This week, <laughs> two days ago, they have 300,000 people just living in Paris. When they visit all these luxury goods and you know, women handbags and shoes, they say, this is ours, this is ours. 90% of the shops actually are owned by them. Many streets. And where do they rent and buy the properties from? from the Jews. He said, all our clients are Jews. So I, I was thinking, how come the, the, the Jews are linking with the Wanzhou people? Then, then I realized China is building a high-speed train to Istanbul and Paris and to um, <laughs> linking, linking the whole of China with high-speed train. They are building it already through all the way to Europe. And what is, what is it together for all of us? Please pray for the church and get yourself involved with the marketplace in China because the destiny of the Chinese church has come uh, to, uh, to place now. Uh, this is a very touching moment of 2,000 people gathering three years ago, you know, 20,000 uh, 20, people gathering. And some of the leaders of the Western church, they were saying to the, to the, to the church leaders in China, please, um, please accept this pattern from us. It's not that you know more than us or you are better than us, but we want you to begin to take the lead. The in, yeah, these are the American pastors. And the Back to Jerusalem movement, it's not a vision for a few people. Most of the Chinese Christians, if you ask them, they understand that for some reason. Because they have no replacement theology, they love Israel, they read the Bible, they want to go back to Jerusalem. That lady was the founder. And this is a very uh, typical of the, some of the meetings that is taking place in Hong Kong. Uh, we see even descendants of the Hamas kneeling down and washed the feet of uh, the Jewish brothers. And we have the eight nations who came to China to colonize China, and they sent their representatives to kneel down before the Chinese people say, this is not a political thing, but we want to ask you Chinese people to forgive us. And so this has been viewed by top Chinese leadership. And, uh, and now, as a possibility in May, the same meeting would take place in China. And uh, this is how the marketplace in China is impacting, uh, I think, uh, interacting with the rest of the world. Today, we live in the convergence of two mighty rivers, the restored, restored kingdom of God in the nation of Israel and the restored functions of the marketplace, especially in China. So as we are living in these two convergence, we know that we all have a role to play. Thank you very much.